So the proof, uh, the existence proof that uh, that there's a covering, that that there exists uh, a covering which isn't separable is uh, is actually a, a pretty difficult geometric construction. It's elementary, but it's somewhat difficult. Uh, it has to do sort of with the way that balls can intersect in R3. But uh, in the case of the original hyperbound, uh, there's a there's a probabilistic proof that you can find a, a covering, and uh, so that's what I'm going to show. A pretty slick application of the one. Okay. Here's how the argument goes. So uh, rather than considering all of our three, I'll just I'll just fix a, a big box, and uh, I can consider larger boxes in the limit. But I'll just worry about a single box for now. And um, so I assume that you've given me a collection of of unit balls which are k covering or some k. And uh, I say two points in the box are equivalent if they're covered by the same set of walls. So since I've fixed the box, there's just a, uh, a, a finite set of points that I care about. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'll just color each ball in my box either red or blue independently, I mean with equal probability, so half half. And I let AX be the event that X is covered by balls of only one color. So that's the event that I want to go up. I'd like uh, each point to be covered, covered by balls of each color. So I want to show that the probability of the intersection of complements is greater than zero. So I'm going to set up a little less local one up. Bar means complement? Yeah, bar means complement. All right. I so, um, adjustments to the so uh, the probability that uh, a given event fails is bounded by two times two to the minus k. So I assume that, that each point was covered k times. So uh, for two to the minus k would be the chance that it would be an upper bound for the chance that uh, that you had just a blue color cover or just a red cover. So I do those. And then, um, so uh, I look at a given point, um, and I look at two points separately. If those two points are, are greater than distance three apart, then they won't have a ball in common. So, uh, so in that case, the events that they're covered by <coughs> monochromatic balls is, uh, is actually independent. So, so I'm in the setup of the Wobbaz Wolfko lemma. I can take a dependency graph which just connects points which are distance less than three apart. And uh, in this case, the degree of the graph is bounded by uh, O of T cubed, where T was the maximal degree. So that's uh, it takes a few minutes to think that one through, so I won't worry about it for now. But, uh, but in this case, if t is O of 2 to the k over 3, then uh, the condition of the low possible bottom is met. And so I'll know that there was a, uh, a positive probability that the random coloring was uh, separation. And then, uh, and then you, can, you can obtain the, the full case of R3 with just a compactness argument. That's and that's a pretty typical example of how the little buzz will go on how it looks. There's a, a obvious notion of locality. Okay. So, uh, so the second example that I want to talk about is, uh, is a little bit more arithmetic, and it uh, goes back to two problems of Irvish, which, which end up being connected to each other. So. Uh, so I, I assume that I have a sequence which is uh, lacanary. So it's a sequence of positive integers, n, j, and I assume it's lacanary. And what that means is that um, the ratio of, the, of consecutive terms in the sequence is at least 1 plus epsilon for, for some epsilon. So, uh, so you could think of n, j as just being like the powers of 2. But that's a typical example of a lacanary sequence. But in general, I consider ones where, uh, where the ratio could be 1 plus epsilon, and so it could be small and fixed. So, uh, I take my sequence and I uh, and I consider the Cayley graph of the integers. So uh, so two integers are are connected in this Cayley graph if uh, if they differ by an element of the sequence. Okay. So uh, and then the question that Erdős posed is uh, is it necessarily the case that the chromatic number of this graph is finite? That was the that was the original question of Erdős. And then uh, there's a second question. 
So oh, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand. The chromatic number is the minimal number of colors you can use, so no adjacent, no, no two adjacent vertices are the same color. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's the color. And uh, so that's the first question. And then the second one is, um, I again assume that I have a uh, black matter sequence in J. And, uh, and I ask, is there a, I think of an angle, is there a theta in between 0 and 1 such that uh, nj times theta is not hence in the torus or Nazi? So those are the two very problems. And uh, so there's a story that it's not Kastelson likes to tell, in which uh, apparently, apparently Erdi should ask him, I think he had asked him the first question, and maybe in, in, toward, toward, almost, toward the end of Erdi's life, he asked Kastelson the, uh, the second problem. And uh, while they were talking, Kastelson pointed out that it was a quick one. There, there, was, there was a reduction to the first. There, there, was a, there was a reduction from the first problem, the second problem, which is one of the next one. So it's actually a reduction to, the, to a special case of the second problem. So uh, we'll end up showing that uh, that you take your black binary sequence and you consider NJ theta, and it actually will be bounded away from zero. So there'll be a theta for which is bounded away from zero. So if you assume that's the case, then you can break the torus. So, so I'm assuming that the little window around zero is delta, and uh, I split uh, R mod Z into uh, some finite number of intervals, each of length delta, and, uh, and I color each of those intervals in color. Okay. And then I can color n and z the color of n times theta. Okay. And then, uh, and then if you think about it for a second, you notice that if m theta and n theta are connected, so in that case, they differ by nj theta, where nj was one of the elements of my binary sequence. And, uh, and that quantity is larger than the delta, so they didn't come up. So it's, it's an easy reduction. Okay. So there's a, uh, just a question on the reduction. Is it one way, or is it actually sort of morally equivalent in, in some sense? Did anyone ever figure that out? Or is like, it's um, one question really harder than the other question? But I might have to get back to you on that, though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's a uh, there's a, a quantitative version of uh, of the lower bound on the window for NJ theta, which is due to Paris and Schleid, and uh, it uses the lower bound. So in this case, I assume that the, the common ratio is 1 plus epsilon. And, uh, and we'll show that there's a lower bound on the size of the window away from zero of, uh, of C times epsilon. Uh, okay. So uh, there's Sequence events. 
and, uh, and there's a short window before the event that you're considering, and then you condition on everything prior to that window. So, so that's what the statement is. And then I assume that I have a, an upper bound for that probability, which is uh, which is x sub i times the probabilities of the events that are nearby. So within the window. So i minus m sub i times i minus one. And uh, so so x sub i. So the weight needs to be larger by that amount. And if there exists such a set of weights, then then in fact the probability of the intersection of the complements is uh, is bounded below by by the product of 1 minus x of j. So, so this would be, I guess, true if these were independent events. It would just be automatic. So right? if, the, if the events were actually independent, then you could just uh, choose x sub i equal to the probability of x sub i. So in general, x sub i would be a little bit larger. OK, so here's a quick sketch of how your argument goes. I won't go into too much detail. But, um, so, so again, you can make a compactness argument. So you really want to care about finite likelihood sequences. And uh, so, so it helps to. You are interested in one over n j. So n j theta is uh, is uh, wrapping around, and it helps to. And and I want to get, so I fix a delta, and I consider. Those theta for which nj theta is smaller than delta. That's the event that I want to rule out. Okay. So and and for each theta, I can cover that that those intervals by dyadic intervals, and it helps to, to cover them by dyadic intervals instead. Okay. So um, so so once I scaled up by nj. The window of length delta looks like a window of length one over nj delta, and then so so this is a periodic function that has period nj, nj theta is a periodic function of period nj, and uh, and it has little intervals of delta. So in each interval of length one over nj, uh, the event has uh, a roughly the same intersection, and so uh, and so if I go back. So remember, my sequence was binary, so it's growing sort of exponentially. So if I go back uh, a distance which is logarithmic in nj, then uh, then the intersection is essentially the same for each interval. So that's the reason that I can condition on a uh, scale that's only logarithmic in nj. So uh, so that's a little less condition gets applied in this case. So it's all. So, uh, so the main problem that I want to talk about is current systems of congruences, and uh, in this, so I consider uh, collections of congruences, so a i mod m i, where uh, I have a finite number of congruences, different modules, so one less than m one less than m two, m k, and uh, and I'm interested in uh, covering systems which cover the integers, so the integers should be the union of those arithmetic progressions. So uh, current systems have uh, a bit of a history, which is, which is interesting. So in 1934, Romanov had shown that integers of the form a power of 2 plus a prime uh, have positive density. And uh, uh, this is surprising because the number of choices, of, if you look up to x, the number of power, powers of 2 is, uh, is logarithmic in x. And the number of primes is uh, essentially of size x over log x. So the number of pairs up to x, uh, whose sum is less than x, is actually order x. And the fact that it has positive density means the number of sums is also of order x. So that tells you that they don't overlap very much. The primes and the of two don't overlap very much. So that was Romanov's statement. And, uh, and according to the story, he, he uh, had figured this out and he wrote to Erdouche and he asked him if uh, there's arithmetic regression which is none of its 
of odd numbers, none of its elements are of the form 2 to the k plus a prime. So, um, and uh, so we already figured this out, and this proof uses the covering system, which I want to show you. Okay, so here's an example of a covering system. This is the one that appears in the original paper. We take uh, 0 mod 2, and uh, take its mean with 0 mod 3, and uh, together with 1 mod 4, and then 3 mod 8. 7 mod 12, and 23 mod 24. So, uh, so notice that all the moduli divide 24. So, uh, so those congruences are 24 periodic. And so it's actually, so to, I didn't need to write the numbers uh, 24 through 29 because I could have just checked whether it covered 0 through 23. But in any case, so that's a, a system of congruences that covers the integers. So, uh, so here's the predictions proof. So you look at the arithmetic progression, which is 2 to the 0 mod 3, 2 to the 1 mod 5, 2 to the 0 mod 7, 2 to the 7 mod 13, 2 to the 3 mod 17, and 2 to the 23 mod 241. And uh, the relevant feature of those modulating powers is that uh, the order of 2 mod 3 is 2. So. Uh, the order of 2 mod 7 is 3, the order of 2 mod 5 is 4, the order of 2 mod 13 is, uh, is 12, the order of 2 mod 17 is 8, and the order of 2 mod 241 is, two, is 24. So, um, so and this was my, my covering system in the integer, 0 mod 2, 0 mod 3, 0 mod 4, 0 mod 8, 0 mod 12, 0 mod 24. So uh, if I take x, which is in this arithmetic progression, and subtract off 2 to the k, or some k, uh, the result is actually divisible by 1 over 3, 5, 7, 13, 17, or 241. Okay? And then you can, so it has, uh, uh, that number already has one time factor. And, uh, and if you restrict this arithmetic progression by a big enough power of 2, you can, you can guarantee that, it, that it's, uh, it also has uh, that it's also not actually equal to one of those primes. So, so in that case, you have at least two prime factors. So the result is not prime. So. That was the history of covering systems. And then, so, so and then Eric had a number of other questions that he asked about. And this is one of the early ones that he asked that was solved very quickly. But, uh, but it has a nice proof, so I put it in any case. Um, so you say a covering system is equal. So uh, you can just consider the density of arithmetic progression. Uh, progression. So if you have a mod m, its density in the integer is essentially is one over m. You take a natural notion of density. And so uh, a necessary condition for there to be a covering system is that the sum of the reciprocals and mod divides at least one. And uh, you say that the covering system is exact if the sum of the reciprocals is exactly one. In that case, the, the integers are actually just joint the image of uh, so, uh, so the, the question is uh, whether every exact covering system has a repeated modulus, and, uh, and the theorem is that, that in fact it does. So uh, it has a slip proof that uses just a little bit of complex analysis. Mm -hmm. Repeated modulus. Oh, sorry. So, so in this case, I'm not talking about distinct covering systems, so I allow repeated modulus. But the question is, so if you have a collection of arithmetic regressions, uh, not including the modulus one, um, and they are, the, the integers is a dis disjoint union of those arithmetic regressions, then in that case, the war, it, in fact, the largest modulus that you had um, has, to be, has to appear more than one. Mm -hmm. Each distinct AI the same MI. <coughs> Two of the MI have to appear more than once. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and, and, and here's how the proof goes. So, so I assume that that the integers are uh, are this disjoint union, and then uh, and then I can form a generating function for the positive integers. So, the generating for the non-negative integers. So, the generating function for the non-negative integers is just one over one minus c. 
that's one plus c plus c squared plus c cubed, and so on. And, uh, and I can write it as the sum on the right, which is uh, z to the ai over 1 minus c to the mi. So that's giving me the sum of uh, the arithmetic regressions and the positive integers. And uh, so in order for those two generating functions to be equal, uh, the poles on the left and the right have to match. And uh, so, and so, in order for the poles on the right to match, the uh, largest moduli that, it, that the largest modulus that appears actually has to appear twice. So it's a it's a through here. Like that. There's a question I think on that slide. Just ask it. Just ask it. Yes, yeah. Uh, why is it a disjoint union? That's the hypothesis. Oh, that's, that's what it means for there to be an exact property. Oh, okay. It's, it's, I thought it was the thing about the reciprocal summing to one. Oh, uh, yeah, but that's actually, so a density argument will tell you that it's actually equivalent to this. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> so Erdős actually asked a number of questions about perfect systems, but at least two of them are somewhat well known. So uh, the first one is the one that I'm talking about, which is the minimum modulus problem. So he asked, uh, if you have a covering system where all the moduli are different, is it the case that the least modulus among them can be arbitrarily large? So I'll show that that's not the case. And then he also asked if you can form uh, a covering system with all different moduli and all odd. And uh, so I worked on that problem a bit, but uh, we still don't know the answer as far as I know. So. So, uh, so for a long time, people had worked on constructing covering systems. And here are some minimum moduli. Some, uh, so th these are minimum moduli covering systems that people constructed. So, uh, so in the 70s, people had found covering systems with modulus 9, 18, and 20. And Warren Powell improved that to 24 in the 80s, which was improved to 25 by Gibson in 2006. And then Nielsen in 2009 improved that to 40. So about how many different uh, congruences are there? Like oh, uh, dozens or millions? So, or? So in the case that Nielsen found, I think there was something like 10 to the 50 congruences. How many? 10 to the 50. Oh. So he actually needed a, a pretty... Well, that's in a long paper. A <laughs> lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he has, he has sort of a nice way of describing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, so, so my argument actually builds on a paper from 2007 uh, by a set of four Kong Yang and Pomerantz and you, and they had sort of shown a partial result in the other direction. So you assume that you have a uh, covering system and the modules uh, are all larger than a parameter m, and then, so their result says that in that case there sort of need to be a lot of congruences. So the sum of the reciprocals and moduli tends to infinity as a function of m. And I think their argument shows that it tends to infinity essentially logarithmically in m. But, uh, so, uh, so my argument will be on this, on this argument. So the real result that I proved is that uh, the, least, the least modulus in the covering, in the distinct covering system is at most 10 to 16. So it's quite large compared to 40, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's modded. And, uh, and so far, I've been working with Casey Wilson uh, on some aspects of this argument. And so far, we could show that the modulus that any distinct covering system has a modulus of by either two or three. So we can't solve the odd problem to this point, but we could show this partial result. And it's it's uh, our argument is an optimization of the one with the little modulus. Okay, okay so I'll, I'll give you some indication of how the argument does. It's a, it's another nice <coughs> application of the level. So I take m, which is 10 to the 16, which is my uh, upper bound on the minimum modulus. And I assume that you've given me a collection of congruences. So script m is the set of moduli. 
and they're all larger than capital M. And I assume that you've given me an ace of M for each M. So that's your function of congruences. And, uh, and I consider the set that's left behind by the union of your congruences. So R is going to be my residual set, the uh, complement of the union of the congruences that you gave me. And the argument will be probabilistic in the sense that I want to show that the density of R is larger than zero. So, uh, so I let capital Q be the least common multiple of the set of uh, mods y that you give me. So in this case, uh, your set of congruence is actually defined module Q. So I can think of it actually as just a finite problem, whether I cover the, the uh, integer Z mod Q. Uh, so, uh, and then I want to consider the density of the set contained in R mod QZ, which I could think of as just putting a uh, uniform probability on Z mod QZ. And uh, in that case, the density is equal to that probability. But in fact, I'll, I'll estimate it with respect to some different measure. And uh, in my argument, it will be necessary to make a sequence of estimates. So uh, I won't be able to estimate the density of that set straight off. But, uh, but so I'll do it in a sequence of stages. So, uh, so, so P0, P1, P2 uh, are going to be a sequence of thresholds. And, uh, and I control the prime factorization of QI, of Q. So, uh, so Q sub I is the part of Q composed just of primes less than PI. So in, in analytic number theory, we call this the PI smooth component of Q. Q sub I is the PI smooth. And then, uh, and then I'll consider a nested sequence of residual sets. So R0 containing R1, containing R2, etc. And R sub i is the set left behind uh, by those congruences that, are, that divide Q sub i. So there's, there's a different notation which I can pop that as well. But, uh, so so I'm, I'm going to estimate R sub i inductively. So it'll be, I'll make a sequence of, of estimates, and, uh, and I have this filtration on the, uh, on the moduli that are involved. So, so just to uh, recap, uh, I have uh, uh, made a filtration based on the prime factorization of the moduli involved. R sub i is the set left over by those uh, mod, by those moduli that by the, uh, they have all prime factors less than the height threshold in my filtration. And, uh, and so uh, just to get the argument started, I'll describe the inductive step. So, so the assumption that I make is that, uh, so capital M was my minimum modulus, and I choose my first threshold, P0, uh, sufficiently small compared to M, so that the P0 smooth numbers larger than M are sparse. So uh, if you look at smooth numbers, so say if you take just the, so if you look at just the powers of two, for instance, and you look up to uh, up to some large capital M, that the density of the powers of two at that stage is roughly one over M. And so, uh, so the that would be an extreme case of very smooth numbers. So say, so in this case, I'm looking at just numbers with very small prime factors, but then a lot larger, and then they're very sparse in that range. So, uh, so in that case, I can estimate the density of the set left behind just with the union bound, and it's bound by one minus the sum of reciprocals of those very smooth numbers. So I'll just assume that that's at most one minus delta, but essentially one. So, so that's that's the uh, the estimate that gets my inductive argument. So you're basically just summing reciprocals of powers of the small primes. So essentially, yeah. They don't add up. They're, they're primes too, but but they're but they're yeah. but they're. There are standard ways of handling that type of estimate that come from analytical work here. So the proof now proceeds by induction. So uh, you can think of uh, Z minus QIZ as a torus.
So I'm thinking of those as the different residues of my QI. And then uh, if I look at Z my QI plus 1Z, it's really a, uh, you can think of it as a torus fibered over Z my QI Z.
So if I so just heuristically, if I knew all the events were independent, so if there were no common factors among any of the moduli, and if I actually knew the distribution was uh, was sort of constant at its mean, which it isn't, but uh, if I knew that that was the case, then I could estimate the density of those fibers. So uh, so heuristically, that's what I'm sort of I wanted to find an approximation to this type of estimate, which would allow the uh, the argument to continue in the subsequent stage. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, there, there's sort of two two issues with that heuristic. The first is that, in fact, the new factors are not generally co-prime. In fact, they typically have common factors. Uh, so sitting by uh, not a uh, moduli that have a common factor is not an independent event. And uh, and also, once I've sued for a long time, the set that's left is the set of fibers. It's not the whole torus. It's actually just uh, some subset of the torus, and so uh, and so I don't actually even know the mean in that case. So I, I don't know all that much about the distribution. So so if I was averaging over the whole torus, then the mean is very easy to calculate or estimate from above. But, but in fact, I won't know most. I won't know all that much <coughs> about the distribution because it's a small set that I'm using. So. Uh, so the. So the basic tool that goes into this part of the argument uh, is uh, is a new is another version of the Lovell one. So uh, so once again, I consider events with a dependency graph, and again, there are going to be a system of weights. So the weights will be numbers that are somewhat larger than the probability of events, and uh, they're larger by this factor, which is the product of the uh, one minus those events that I'm connected to. So remember that the edge set told me that, that I'm independent of anything that I'm not connected to. So the, the product over things that I'm connected to is making xi somewhat larger than the probability of AI. And, uh, and I call this a relative form of the Lovell Polyma because, um, because I look at the probability intersection. And uh, I, in general, I just the, the standard form of Wilbaz Wilbaz even in this case, would just give me a warp bound by the product, 1 minus xi. So if those weights exist, then I get a warp bound for the probability of the complements. Um, and uh, I call it a relative form because I'm allowed to condition on some finite number of the events. So I condition on i equals 1 to m, and I just take that probability out, and then, and then, the, then I have a warp bound for the full intersection, which includes the product of the remaining one. So that's that's a relative form. So so in general, it's a it's a problem for a quantum polynomial that I want to have a one-sided bound. I want to have a lower bound. But the fact that I have a relative form will actually sort of allow me to uh, to leverage that into an upper bound also. So I end up with, with a signal which is almost uh, two-sided bound. So is this a previously known result, or is this something you developed? Yeah. Uh, so or? so it, it's sort of uh, it's sort of not written down in this way very often, but uh, but it sort of stand follows sort of exactly from the proof. So, yeah. so the proof is essentially the same. Okay. So just in our context, uh, so uh, I always put, so I'll end up putting a somewhat different measure on, on the base set, but I always put uniform measures on the fibers. And, uh, and so uh, in this case, sitting by a sub n r mod n is an event with probability the size of a sub n r divided by n. And, uh, and it follows from the Chinese remainder theorem that I can choose a dependency graph which just has edges between events uh, when there's a common factor. And I, I should point out that I'm thinking that there are there's sort of two, two senses in which there's randomness. So there's the individual fiber that I'm fi fibering over. And that's where I'm applying the Lovell's local lemma, but I'm actually applying it uh, in a sequence of probabilities space indexed by the base set. So that's the situation that I'm in. And in fact, uh, I won't be able to apply it on some of the base set, so uh, and not on the whole space. So. So a crucial feature of the argument is that uh, so. But I haven't written down the precise meaning of what it means to be a good fiber, but it actually, the meaning of good fiber is just that a fiber in which there exists a lot of weights. Essentially, that's all that you'll need for there to be a good fiber. And uh, so within good fibers, 
where the Rojas Oklahoma applies. The relative form of the Rojas Oklahoma also guarantees that the set that's left behind is well distributed. So, uh, so, there's a, so there's an upper bound on the bias in the sitting that results. So, so I'm looking within the individual fiber, and then say within the fiber, maybe I, I look at the maximum size of Z mod 3Z uh, of, of uh, arithmetic regressions to base 3 within that fiber, or within or to base another modulator that's a new module in the fiber. And, uh, and I don't end up being biased in those progressions very much. So I have actually the only thing to control on the bias. So I, I look at the maximum residue uh, to a new modulus, you know, the sitting set, that's Ri plus 1. I intersect with uh, E mod n, which is one of the new moduli. And then I look at how large that is compared to the whole set that's left behind. And it's bounded just in terms of the number of prime factors of n. So if there hadn't been any sitting going on, I would have a ratio of uh, 1 over n here. Um, so if Ri plus 1 was the entire fiber, then uh, each E mod n would have the same size, 1 over n. And, uh, and in fact, I have a bound which just depends on the number of prime factors of n. And this is a statement that improves using the relative form of the one. So that extra structure is really crucial to, to how the argument progresses, because if that structure wasn't there, it wouldn't be able to continue the argument in an inductive fashion. So, so is that structure <coughs> taking care of that second problem you talked about, about the, the sitting not having very good structure, or a priori, that we sort of fixing that second problem you referred to before? So there were two problems. One was the independence, and the independence is roughly handled by the local lemma. And then the extra structure, yeah, it's sort of, it, it feeds into, so, you know, in the initial argument, you can actually calculate moments of the size of the sitting set, and you can put in tail columns. So you can say that most of the sets are not very large. And uh, so, so this is what I'm, I'm saying here, is that you can sort of reweight the probability set at each stage, so that the set that looks, you know, you knew it was, a, it was not very biased in progressions, and you can actually make it look sort of large, in the sense that the moments won't grow very quickly when you take averages over them. So, uh, so that's a calculation that I won't show you, but anyway, that goes into the argument that you can sort of reweight the, the probability space <laughs> like that in such a way that, that, the, that the new sitting sets at each stage don't look very large. So that's the notion of a pseudo-random measure, which appears in, in, in uh, arithmetic combinatorics pretty frequently now. So, uh, so those, that's, that's an important feature of the argument, that the, the extra structure goes into that phase of the argument. And uh, yeah, and then, then tail bounds are put in to a quantum level of whole number. So I use moments to truncate the sets of the system sets. So uh, just to describe some of the things that Casey Wilson and I have been thinking about regarding this argument. So um, there was a, in the 80s, there was a form of the rules of Oklahoma found by Shearer, which uh, has now been interpreted in terms of the partition, partition function of a hard portal at a scats. So uh, in this case, you should think of particles at each, at each number n. And uh, hard core means that there's no interaction between uh, numbers that are connected in a dependency graph. So that's sort of the situation that you're in in the in the, in the Lobos Oklahoma, and and Shearer showed that. So that that the partition function is uh, is uh, gives the optimal form of the Lobos Oklahoma. So I, I won't say more about that, but in any case, it's a somewhat interesting object to study. And uh, we found that that in this case, if you look at the graph associated with that partition function, uh, it naturally decomposes in cliques with the cliques indexed by primes. And uh, you can take the logarithmic derivative of the partition function with variables associated with those primes. And uh, that, that uh, function, it, it's a classical fact that it decomposes into uh, prim primitive objects, which in this case are Penrose trees. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a fact that goes back to Penrose. And, uh, and it's somewhat analogous to the factorization of the data function as a product over primes. So that type of analysis allows us to give somewhat better bounds in the laws of Oklahoma. We have to the laws of Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, in my original argument, I used, uh, so you end up needing uh, tensors of sizes of sitting sets to apply to the lemma. Because, and, uh, and I was using convexity in that case. But uh, we insert into that argument these types of tree expansions controlling logarithmic derivative. And, uh, and then a stochastic fixed point equation. So in this case, you're thinking that uh, 
the sieving sets are random objects over the random set, which is uh, the, the base set. And then we've been interested in analyzing the inverse problem of, of finding structure in sieving sets, which are sort of make that partition function. Uh, so that particular <coughs> the partition function's logarithmic derivative has a radi radius of convergence, which is what uh, people are mostly interested in in studying when the local limit can be applied. And, uh, and so we're interested in the inverse problem of deciding what sets make uh, that radius, uh, cause you to approach the radius of convergence. So, so I'm not quite sure what tree expansion is. Is it just the sum or a product where the indexing set has a tree structure? or is that um, Yeah, so originally we had a, uh, so uh, the, let's see, so let me think about this for a second. So you could, you could describe uh, the partition function as a sum over, uh, a sum over, Doing this all over a lattice. It looks like the following type of sum. So, so I think of G as indexing, uh, maybe I should say a collection of sets. Well, I don't want to divert you, but it's a technical point. I just. Uh, yeah, so it looks like 1 minus the sum over the size of AI uh, plus the sum over. Sorry, I'm too small. Uh, so, uh, if you if you if you um, if you wrote down inclusion and inclusion, the inclusion and exclusion, you, would, you wouldn't have any condition here. You would just have to estimate uh, the, the size. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, so if the sets are independent. Then you could expand the product. Of, you could expand product one minus product. AI, and you would have terms like this. But in the partition function, you have conditions including independence, which is really a sum over the graph. So the graph is telling you things about independence, and then uh, and then you taking the logarithmic derivative, you can turn that into a sum over trees, and uh, and so that's what I mean by trees. Trees. But I probably should. So, but I'll, I'll wrap it up here. So. Uh, there's a thing that there's so probably the most famous open problem regarding that's similar to uh, congruences regards BD, BD, BD sequences. Uh, so in this case, you look at uh, alpha and beta are real parameters, and I assume alpha is larger than zero. And you look at uh, four of alpha n plus beta. So it's not an arithmetic progression, but it behaves somewhat like an arithmetic progression. And then uh, and then people are interested in when these uh, sequences, if you can find a collection of them which partitions the integers. And, uh, and the, the conjecture is that if you have a uh, collection like this that exactly partitions the integers, then the ratio of 2 of the alpha i has to be actually be in the <coughs> So uh, that's probably the most famous open problem of this type. And then uh, already, uh, so we, we would, we've been trying to resolve the ad problem, but haven't succeeded at this point. But if you could uh, rule out covering systems that, that satisfy somewhat <laughs> Even a somewhat more restrictive condition, then you could say things about uh, the irreducibility of families of polynomials. That's a motivation for studying the systems. And uh, so this is sort of a, a little bit of a non sequitur, but it's another interest of mine. So uh, recently, uh, Terence Tal solved a, a very famous irreducible problem uh, of a different kind, which is uh, related to the discrepancy of uh, integer functions. So you assume that f is a function from positive integers to, to, to plus or minus 1. And you look at the sum of that function over dilations, and, uh, and he showed that, uh, that the discrepancy is infinite. So if you look at a sum j equals 1 n, f j times d, and you take the super over n d, then that sum tends to infinity, although it tends very, very slowly. So people are analytic numbers are very interested in these sorts of things because they model uh, characters, uh, Dirichlet -like characters, real Dirichlet -like characters, although it's uh, behavior slightly different. So, uh, so that was the amazing result. And uh, it's, uh, it's a nice feature of the argument that uh, that it reduces the question to a question pose to casting multiplicative functions, so random multiplicative functions. And uh, that's actually a pretty uh, an area of research which is pretty active now and still developing. So that's something that I've studied a little bit. And, uh, and uh, so hopefully there will be more applications of probability number theory, and especially using the Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Questions, comments? Well, I'm just curious, does any
intuition as to whether 40 or 2 to the 16 is closer to the uh, uh, Yeah, I think people think probably 40 is closer. Yeah, yeah, closer to 40. That's right. By the way, uh, where, uh, where was 2 to the 16 in your pool for? Why does it show up? Yeah. Uh, well, so, um, so I've been thinking about, uh, so if you look at the, so, but D of, D of N equal the number of uh, M such that M divides N, so I'll divide the function. So if you look at, uh, Sum n less than or equal to x, g of n, that's passing by the x of x. And in general, the types of moments that I consider are white divisor functions. So they grow on average logarithmically mass. And, uh, and the sort of what the feature of the argument that I'm considering is you're sitting by things that the size of the sitting set is king of 1 over n. Okay, but the average size of the amount I sieve is, is its moments are growing sort of logarithmically in n. But uh, but first moment estimates are enough, so I need higher divisor functions, and so they grow like big powers of log n. Okay, but uh, but it takes a long time for a big power of log n to, be, to look small compared to n, and so uh, and so that's actually why uh, estimates take a long time to, to work to kick in. So that, that's one feature. And there's also the smooth number. It takes a while for the smooth number to sparks also. So those are two things that take, take a while. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thanks. Let's speak at a time.